was going to happen. Um, this is historic because Colonel Philip Corso did only talk, spoke for two years. He really was someone who was a hero. All right, he was 83 years old. His book, The Day After Roswell, which was co-authored by William Burns, came out at the 50th anniversary of the Roswell crash. I was there as a reporter. It, I have written a book about this, and I will talk about all the coincidences that happened that I was the journalist that was the closest to Corso, but I was also able to bring him to Italy two times to testify in front of the world. I'm going to add one more thing, though. It is very sad that our own researchers criticized Corso so much that the Monday before he died, he called me on the phone and said, I'm sorry I ever wrote the book. I am among a group of vultures. He said, because, he said, I did work at the Pentagon, I was in research and development, I did do these things, I came forth not for money, because when he was buried, they had to borrow money to bury him. It was after he was dead that the money was made by the people. But the thing is this, that it is a situation within the ufological field that people as brave as Colonel Philip Corso, and why didn't he talk? Because I asked him, I said, Colonel, at 83 years old, why, why did you come out? He said, because we had made an agreement with General Trudeau that the last one alive would tell the truth. And he said, the reason I did it, and he showed me his three grandchildren. He said, for these three boys, that we, he, the, part of the agreement was that we bring the boys to Italy because Colonel Corso's background was that he was from Sicily, Sicily, Sicilian. And he wanted his grandchildren to see Italy, so we paid for him and his grandchildren and his daughter-in-law to come the two times he came. But <clears throat> it was very dangerous what he was saying, very dangerous. And in my book I talk about, and I don't know if I have time to talk about one situation, where I pulled Colonel Corso out of a car because we were on a mountaintop and we were left alone in the car and I thought this car is going to blow up and I pulled him out of the car because I thought don't sit in this car, everybody left, we're here alone. And I will tell you that his death is suspect. And that is a real whistleblower. <laughs> because what he was telling the world was that there was an economy behind the artifacts of crashes. There's an economy because the way the military industrial complex thinks is that this is a gold mine because if they can back engineer what's in those, they, and he will tell you, they will become the most powerful uh, military on earth. So he even said to me, that it, because he's just Army. The Army Air Force was together in 1940, uh, 1945 was Army Air Force, they were together. Then they split up in 1948, and in 1947 where it was Army and Air Force. So Colonel Corso said, what I had in my hands, and he will talk about it here, so I don't have to talk about it, thank God we filmed in, he's talking about it. And everything that I do, I do not talk about it. It's the people that talk about it to me and I record it. So my job and my legacy will only be to leave you the original people, not to make judgments on them. I leave you the original people, you make a decision, and you will say, why didn't they let them speak in the United States? Many reasons. One of them is that there was a lot of jealousy in the, fifth, in the 19. Uh, 47, uh, 50th anniversary because his book had the name Roswell on it and all the other books weren't selling because this one was selling the greatest. So those guys started looking. They didn't sit at the table and say, Colonel, what do you know and you can help us? They said his book is selling more than this book. Colonel, come, come to have coffee 
you and the Stoics, everything you know. We've been working on Ra's role for a long time. That doesn't happen. They said he's lying. He's trying to make money. And he's 83 years old. And uh, his children, his grandchildren were there. So, uh, and I'll tell you how I got to meet him because it was not something I wanted to do. It was not a case I wanted to do. However, the first thing you're going to see is we were in San Marino, and uh, it's in my book, and he, he said, and this is the permission I have to talk to you, he talked about what he wanted to have happen after he died. So Colonel, we're, we're doing what you want. So you can, you can uh, play that piece. Thrust of the horrorization. The extraterrestrial 
himself, or I will say, that's the greatest gift they gave us, and we did nothing with it. And who was in charge? I was. So that meant I did nothing with it. Now, in my old age, maybe I feel guilty, and I've been writing about it now. When I wrote to my own doctor, I get out of the thing I gave, I put it in an envelope, took it to the doctor, this friend of mine, and on the envelope I wrote, help, doctor. He knew what I meant to the lymphatic system. He's a surgeon. He's expert at that. He operates in that area. I'm no doctor. I can't carry that on. I don't know anything about what I know about the lymphatic system, what I've read. But here's a man who saves people alive. I can save mine doing that. No one what's there. The lungs know all the same thing. Experts have to come into this and look at this entity or this being. After all, he is a biological entity. All these stories of clones and all it's against religion and uh, uh, it's all for a man who wants to live forever and uh, it, it affects emotion. That's all baloney. It, it doesn't enter into this area alone. At all. It, does, uh, it doesn't enter this area at all. Because that clone was made for another purpose. He's not the New York Derby says that we write what clones are like. Made it for another purpose, to travel in space. They want to see what space is like. They came here. Without, without that car, the way that was made with a flying saucer, they would have even never made it here. Maybe they have something else, I don't know, but I don't know of any. Can I, can I switch to another subject for a second? Yeah. Like, um, uh, there was in Procedia, uh, the uh, word, first word, uh, Former president, a guy named uh, Cook Sherman. This researcher uh, researchers stated that uh, in the last 50 years, maybe, but to be more precise, 35 years, 167 UFO researchers died for unknown causes, such as strange suicides or uh, heart attacks, very, very sudden heart attacks with no. Uh, medical records before and eventually uh, brain tumors and so far so on. His theory was that the UFO researchers are very keen to disappear sooner or later for no reasons, for no apparent reasons. Uh, I can um, I can give you credibility on that story. Because of what you told me, there are many, many cases where people die from tumors when they haven't ever had any before. There are many cases when they die from diseases that they never showed before. There are many hundreds, thousands of cases where people have never had a heart pain and die or once a heart attack. There's too many cases where that happens to humans. So I can't go back and say, when a doctor would come to me and say, hey, of course, what are you talking about? I know about a thousand cases of people die of heart attack. I can't isolate it to the flying saucer cause that. Because there's too much of that happening every day anyway. Yeah, I could say that uh, I can't come and tell you I know. It happens every day, it's too precise. You know, see, every day yeah, I can't the, come and tell you. The irony is that he was asking a question about my boss. He was asking a question about how dangerous she put the pump. Uh, about how dangerous it was what he was talking about. And, it, and I, I don't have any of my books here. You have to go to Amazon.com for conversations with Colonel Corso. Because every time I would talk to him in a car, or every time I talked to him, I'd never remember anything. So in my pocket, I had a tape recorder. So I waited 20 years to translate from the tape recorder what he said because a book came out this year. I waited 20 years because he's so controversial and people start bashing and, um, uh, you know, discrediting and everything. I didn't want to go through that. So I waited a long time and before I printed the book. And the book is all audio tape. It's all audio tape. Uh, it is not anything that I thought about. And the only part that's me is how I 
Matt Corso. Um, because I asked him everything. And I will tell to you about um, some of the things that are in the book. It's called Conversations with Colonel Corso. It's very small. I, I you know, I, if you want to know the real truth about why the secret is secret, it's because it's part of an economy. When he said night screening devices, he meant uh, when I met him, I asked him about the Santilli autopsy footage. I don't know if you people ever saw the Santilli autopsy. And I said, Colonel, what do you think of that? And he said, that looks real because what I had in the file they gave me was a lens. It was like a plastic lens. He said that I would hold up and we would walk up and down the halls of the Pentagon where my office was and I could see things, uh, I could see the furniture through it without light. In other words, in the darkness he could see things through this lens. So the being that they had bodies of, that I had to memorize 180 pages, had a lens, that is not an eye. It's peeled off in the Santilli footage, if you saw it, they peeled the lens off because that's a light collector. So it collects light. So if you're going to have a lens like that from the beam, you're going to back engineer or create night screening. And he's army, so he's going, oh great, we can make night screening devices for our soldiers in Vietnam. And that's what he said. That did something good. But all of those things that he had, the fiber optics, the, uh, the integrated circuits and everything, all those things he had went first for military purposes and then went out into the general public. So you can get a nice screening camera now. And you can get things now. The only thing you can't get, and he talked about a pen he had, and he'll talk about it, and unfortunately, um, I don't have the, the audio where he talks about it, because we don't have time. I have a 48-minute interview where he talks about part of what he was given was this pen, long black pen, that he thought the batteries were dead, until he took it to Fort Belvoir, Maryland, where they put long low waves on it and a laser shot off out of this pen. But this pen could cut during surgery and close the wound. But they didn't use the pen for that purpose. The Russians have that pen. You can read it in my book and you can buy it. But the Americans had that pen and used it only for the laser part. Not for, and, and I have in the book this doctor from Durango who wrote to Corso and said, I need that instrument. Because that instrument is so advanced that it cuts, no blood, cuts, and then it closes. And so Corso said, look, I had that, I'm sorry that we didn't put it into the general public. And then in my book, he talks about how some scientists went to Russia, they saw that pen, and they were not allowed to bring it back to the United States. So, Technology is very important. And I, that am ignorant, was I was just doing the story saying, oh, the reason why they don't talk about it is because the aliens scare people. And the reason why they don't talk about it is because it's so weird. That isn't the reason why this, if this is secret. It's money. It's an economy. And the problem is that, as Stephen Greer says, and he is still my hero, we had the capacity, 1950, to have free energy. And that will not come out until every drop of the petrodollar and oil is finished. And we have no control over that. And that is why, the, 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 are there back engineered UFOs? Yes. In my, one of my books, I talk about, we don't know if it's our stuff or their stuff anymore. I don't know what I'm looking at over Belgium. There's a triangle, but we also have a triangle. Uh, we have also back engineered the triangle. So, you know, the, the aurora. So, you know, I'm thinking, this is so mixed up. And it's mixed up with the technology 
in the capacity, and he said, weapons of war. It is, that is the first thinking. So you think the extraterrestrials I was talking about yesterday want to come to the United States? You know, and nobody's going to come up and say, hi, how are you, where do you come from? They're going to say, get out of the craft, or, you know, we'll kill you, you take your craft and everything inside. So those people aren't going to go to any more. That's the thinking. I've seen so many. I saw the Bushman uh, take the, the Richard Dome. He goes, we don't care about the bodies. We go in, Bushman says, and we wanted the craft. And so with that kind of thinking, the, the idea that the most technologically advanced country is going to win something, uh, you know, we don't, uh, we look at the situation, the secrecy behind it, as the idea of having the artifacts. And Colonel Corso had the artifacts. He was given them in a trade. And uh, I will, in my PowerPoint, I'll talk about this. How do I get to the first slide? The Tadio fix it. Okay. Okay, well that's, you know, we brought him to Rome, so Italy was different. Italy had the television cameras there, and they interviewed him, and here we are in uh, Monte Mario on top of Italy. And uh, um, it's very sad for me to do this, because I was very, very attached to the colonel, and he left me this time, he, he was he's gone on. So I have it in my house, and he also left me his briefcase. And uh, a lot of the people that I work with are no longer with us. He left me that time. Uh, and I brought him to Italy, and my job, if you really want to know, besides being a journalist, I, I was bodyguarding him. I was, I was watching that nobody that came near him that wasn't supposed to. Uh, and exo politics, in my view, is, is, should be, but this is just me, so everything I tell you is just my opinion, should be a common academic study of the extraterrestrial presence on Earth and the political as well as sociological Im implications of this contact for the peoples of Earth and governments of Earth. And as I told you, I have a diplomatic background, so I want it to be serious. I don't like it when they laugh. And if you, you know, this, and I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, Paul Hellyer uh, flew me to his 90th birthday party, and I was very, even though I've never spoken in Canada, he flew me to his 90th birthday party, uh, and he said to me, Paul, everybody's laughing at me in here. Um, would you please um, give a five-minute speech uh, and talk about my involvement with UFOs? Because, you know, Paul is, no, it was a former minister. These were all ministers at this birthday party. They were older people. And they laughed. So I took the microphone and I said, when you have a pilot of Air France, Jean-Jacques de Buck, and I interviewed him, and he sees a UFO right in front of him over Paris, and he has 300 passengers in the airplane, and he doesn't know what to do, and the, 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 uh, uh, the UFO is over a nuclear insta installation. Do you think that's funny? And then I said, and when, and Robert will speak to this, and when 10 missiles are shut down that have nuclear warheads in Maelstrom Air Force Base, and one after the other, and the poor, you know, soldiers don't know where it's coming from or what to do, do you really think that's funny? And this did happen. So is this not a matter of national security? That you couldn't hear a pin drop? Because we have 300 to 400 situations of matters of national security. In the Russian case, they activated the missile codes. You think the Russians are, this is 1969, so we have the Cold War and all this. You think that they are not upset that the, the missiles are going to take off? <laughs> and they can't do anything about it. And this is the extraterrestrial's way, and I know Robert will go into this in detail, of saying, we control this. You people are playing with fire. And, and, uh, and, and when Robert talks, you're going to hear exactly that it's real, because he's the, he was there when this happened. So nobody laughed. And Paul came up to me afterwards and said, thank you so much. Because people are understanding 
that this is not a joke, it's not cartoons, and it certainly is not entertainment. So let's get off the internet stuff. This is not fun. It is a, a learning, and it's a learning about um, what we what part this planet plays in the cosmos. What part this planet uh, is is you know what part of the anthropological study we are right now? Because if we are at this point in our evolution, there are planets down there that are much more evolved, and there are planets this way that are much less evolved and much more primitive. And these people are going, I'm going to call them people, I don't like the word aliens, are going from here to here to here to here to see at what point they, uh, we are. So anyway, the book originally was called The Day, the Day After Roswell, it was a bestseller, made five million dollars later on, after he's dead. And uh, it was Simon and Schuster. And the criticism in the United States, people would stand, I'm not going to name the researchers, but it's in my book who went after him, very famous researchers who went after him, uh, and spent their whole presentations just bashing Colonel Corso and Paul Hellyer. Their whole presentation was that. I remember once I, uh, I was president at one of these researchers' presentations, and I started to cry because I knew Colonel Corso. And I went down to the bar, and Nick Pope was there. And I said, why are they doing this? Can't, don't they have research that they are doing? Can't they talk about their own research? Why is their presentation going after other people? And Nick said, Paula, you don't understand. When you're paid to do that, <coughs> you're paid to go after Colonel Corso. And you, you're going to go where the money is. And he's the one that told me that. And I thought, oh no. The real notes of Colonel Corso, and I gave two or three to you, to your group, uh, you have his handwritten notes, is called The Dawn of a New Age. Uh, anyway, there's my magazine, and you'll see The Dawn of a New Age in a minute. There's all my crew. Uh, I'm, down, I'm kneeling down. I've been writing for X Times for a long time. That's our magazine, uh, Adriano, uh, Alberto, all the group, there's Maurizio on the green, on the second from the right, that used to be the, the, um, the editor, he's the one questioning Corso, and now Lavinia Pelota is the editor of X Times. If you read Italian, it's an excellent magazine. Here are my books, they're all on, online. Uh, this is the one that has the Spanish, the last 150 pages, all the Spanish, from Luis uh, Fernando to Ricardo Gonzalez and Sisto Paz and Veronica's uh, interviews. This, this is the one. And I, and, <laughs> and I have decided to try to mold the, the UFO situation going towards the bottom line, which is the raising of you, uh, human consciousness. I can do data, I'm going to do data, this is nuts and bolts, this is data, I've been doing data for a long time with Colonel Corso, with all the, the crashes, I've, with all the people, the military and so forth, but um, there's, there is Stone Stone there, see him, he's next to Heidi Mossad, who will come with the latest research on the Nazca mummies and present it to the public. So the thing is that I have to have all of this. But what the bottom line is, is I don't want to scare the people. I do not want to uh, depress the people. What I like to do is inspire the people to look at if we can become a better planet, if we can take responsibility <coughs> for ourselves. And I do fun things. There's Sisto on the end. Uh, he will be there. You know, people know J.J. Hurtak, uh, Don Schmidt, who is an excellent, excellent Roswell researcher. I have to have both come together, and the bottom line has to be what Essen's brilliant talk was about, and I hope you, you were here for that the first day, that the bottom line is consciousness raising. It's consciousness. The beings, the only thing you have in common with them if they come walking in here is consciousness. You certainly don't have a, an intellectual connection. You can't. They're too far uh, evolved. And there's my friend Alan. There's Clifford Stone. 
Uh, and I've been working, I published Fred Clifford Stone's book. I, I, uh, he uh, spoke into a tape recorder and he talked about the 12 crash retrievals he did. So I'll make sure that was up. You saw this yesterday. I'm going to tell you eventually about the, the uh, contact that Colonel Philip Corso had. Um, here I am in at the Washington Press Club as a journalist. I'm not a ufologist, I'm a newspaper person. So look at me as a journalist. And what I said to the people, and this is international, there's um, uh, Gita Boudet from France. There is uh, Jaime Maussan from Mexico, Antonio Gunez from, from Chile. There's Robert Salas in the back. I'm there, uh, there's Alfred Weber, there's um, Steve Bassett, Richard Dolan, Nick Pope, and Michael Saab. We were all there and in Washington at the press club, and I told the media, you have a responsibility just to do the story without making any judgments. And if Washington Post wrote the story the next day, the red vote, the blue vote, and the little green man vote, and they ridiculed our appearance at the Washington Post, ridiculed it, even after we were very serious people from all over, from all over, from we were all over the world. The ridicule is still there. So the only way you're going to fight this is give them the real material. And don't go to the internet. Read the books of the people that live this. Because a lot of what internet has is entertainment value. So I said to the journalists, you have, if there's some kind of incident, like the one over Paris that Jean-Charles de Bach talked about, you have a responsibility to cover that. Because he was a pilot, he came down and he said, I don't know what to do, I had all these people in the plane, I'm going to crash right into this thing. He's only one pilot. He's only one of very many. Uh, so this is, comes from Odin to Kabbalah, this is a case in Italy. We have photographs, we have movies, we have sightings, we have enough stuff to know UFOs are real. The next question is, what do you want to do about it? So there's the book. There's the number of sightings that MUFON does. And I'm not going to bash MUFON. They do these things. I don't want to do these things. I don't want to uh, put how many uh, uh, UFOs are over those states. I, I don't have time to do the data collecting. It's not some most data collecting. They have to call somewhere. They're going to call a, a, an entity that serves a purpose. And I can't, I don't want to work with that because I'm way past that, but they serve a purpose. There's not many sightings. Believe it or not, the government put out this book, the, the, uh, and I have a copy, I saw on 101. It's an extraterrestrial entities and technology recovering disposal. It comes from uh, the MJ-12 documents. So, is, is the, if you go to look, is the proof out there? Yes. I have a copy of that. I, well, I interviewed with Paul Heller, and I flew there on my own money. Nobody ever gives me any subsidy to go do these things. I was very curious, because he's the one that called the general on, on, uh, about whether Corso was telling the truth. Do you remember yesterday he said he's telling the truth and more? I don't know what the more is. What's the more? And more. There's more. I don't know what the more is. Anyway, here he is when he first came out with a panel, and there's my colleagues with him, um, and uh, in the University of Toronto. And, and this is, uh, you know, this is part of my interview. He said he wrote, he read Corso's book. He knew it was authentic because he knew the people involved. He knows the generals. I mean, he, he was during the Kennedy administration when McNamara was Minister of Defense, Paul Hellyer was Minister of Defense for uh, Francois Truffaut. And yet people laughed at him at his 90th birthday. Remember? It's hard for people to believe this. It's hard for them to digest it. So anyway, um, here's this, uh, the part he said, uh, I was, I read the book and I realized uh, every word is true and more. And then he, you know, he, he told his wife he was getting married at, at 84. He said, I'm only going to do this one time. Don't worry, I'll just speak one time. He's been speaking 10 years now. This is a responsibility. These people are taking the responsibility. What they are is heroes in my, in my, uh, because his wife is not excited about his speaking about UFOs. They just 
just got married. And uh, so, okay. Oh, let me go to the next one. Protocols are discussed. Uh, I did a story of the 1945 crash. I told you yesterday there was the first crash was August of 1945 after the atomic bomb. Well, who was there was Oppenheimer? Because I, I went to, uh, I saw where Oppenheimer's um, cabin was, was near the Alibar Cafe in San Antonio. And at the time, silos involved also. And they knew, they knew that when the bomb came up, there was always UFO sightings. So there's a document, a Majestic 12 document, that I could also give to you if you write to me. Uh, and to President Truman, it says, um, Relationships with inhabitants of celestial bodies by Einstein and Oppenheimer. And it was dated 1947, and it says, we got to do something about this. The United Nations can't handle this. we got to do Shouldn't we give them a piece of land? Do they have culture? All the questions you should ask when you realize that we're being visited by cultures, people that have culture. People. Not the little clones running around. The cartoons that you see for UFOs and UFO Congress. I wish they'd stop putting that cartoon little gray. No self-respecting scientist will come into a conference with those kinds of cartoons, blow up aliens, everybody walking around with ten hats. These men were worried because they knew, because all of the sightings around New Mexico at that time. Why did we have crashes? Somebody asked me that yesterday. I've been in New Mexico so many times. The storms are terrible. The lightning storms are terrible. In that 1945 crash, the lightning storm was so bad. It interferes with the, um, with the propulsion system. Never seen lightning like that. This document is an MJ-12 document. Relationships with extraterrestrial uh, Men present present no basically a new problem from the standpoint of international law. This is a serious document that Oppenheimer and Einstein had. You know, I mean, this document, I use it all the time because I said they're thinking it's exopolitics in the end, because exopolitics is what we do. So, anyway, so how did I make Colonel Corso? Um, what happened was in, in uh, 1997, uh, which was the 50th anniversary, I was in Rome and I was very depressed because I had just broken up a relationship and my boss says, no, you, I have to go to Roswell to cover the story. I said, I don't want to do that. I said, I, I'm not the mood. He goes, Paul, he said, they all know you. They're going to pick you up at the airport. I said, but I don't have a place to stay and I'm not ready and I don't even know what this guy looks like. Why are you sending me? And he goes, because it's so important. He said, I've got to, I've got to put it in the magazine. So I flew to um, Colorado. The van was waiting. I um, went with Richard Sigismund. I don't know if I have a picture of him. This is the solid port van where it took place. Um, this is the Roswell Museum. It took place there. Uh, let me go back. Anyway, it took place here. The Sally Port Inn, all, everybody was there. Bud Hopkins, John Mack, Linda Howe, everybody was there. Everybody that was anybody was at the party. And this was the 50th anniversary. So I uh, went into the press office at the UFO Museum and I said, I'm from Italy and I've got to cover this. I have no place to sleep. Uh, and they said, every hotel has been booked since February. Uh, you've got to go 40 miles down the way. I said, can I don't have a car. I can't come back. They said, well, let's open up the phone book and try to see if there's any room. Well, I opened the phone book. I put my finger on the first place. It was a Sally Port Inn. They said, we have a room for three nights. And the room ended up being next to Colonel Corso. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I didn't know that, though. I just said, oh, they got room. They got room. Oh, and I went there. <laughs> and I said, and all I have to do is just go to the museum, which is down the street and everything. What happened is I went to the press conference at the museum, and Corso is there with Bill Burns, and I was thinking, how in the world am I going to talk to this man? I didn't, that's him, right? I, mean, I didn't even know what he looked like. I said, when all of these people want to talk to him, how am I going to do it? So this uh, blonde man that was next to me <clears throat> said, you're from Italy? I said, yes. He said, ask my father a question. 
question in Italian. I said, that's your father? And he goes, yes, he speaks perfect Italian. He was the head of intelligence in Rome in 1945. I said, really? And I said, well, I really don't. And he took his hand and he shoved me <laughs> right in front of the press. I had no choice because he pushed me right in the front of the press. And I just stood up and said, um, do you, what do you think of the Santilli footage? You know, because I, then it was the big thing, uh, the uh, alien autopsy, and he said, I think there's a lot of truth to it. He said, because when they peeled off the, the lens, he said, that's what I had in my hand at the Pentagon. He says, well, hey, you know, the, the alien. In other words, when, I don't know if you've ever seen it, they peeled, you think that the being has these two big eyes. It's a lens that they peeled off, and you could see the, the pupil underneath. And so when he said that, he said, I need to talk to you. <coughs> He said, he pointed to me, he said, I have to talk to you. He says, I have something to tell you. And, uh, and I, I said, okay, I don't know how I'm going to get you. Everybody in the world wanted interviews. Everybody in the world wanted. But I realized, because I saw him come out the door, he was right next door to me. So I thought, oh, well, you know, this is easy because he's right next door. And so I said, Colonel, can I have an interview? And uh, this is us in Italy. This is a 1997 interview with Colonel Corso. He discussed contact. I'm going to tell you about this because I knew what I wanted as an interview. I wanted how he back engineered the alien technology. He was not at Roswell in 1947. Colonel Corso, and I gave you all the records. I brought all Colonel Corso's military records and gave them to Talia. So he has them here. He's made copies because I was able to, we were able to get him with the Freedom of Information Act. He was at Fort Riley, Kansas in 1947 in charge of Fort Riley, Kansas establishment when a cargo came by and one of the soldiers said, Colonel, in the veterinary quarters, this makes me laugh because that's where the horses are, in the veterinary quarters there's these big, um, you know, cases and it's very curious. So Colonel Corso walks in, he opens up and he talks about this. He opens up the top of the veterinary, of uh, the, uh, the cases, and he sees a body of a being lying in blue liquid. And he goes, okay, you get out of here. We're not supposed to see this. He closes the thing. Uh, he tells the military man to get out. And he said, Paula, I put it in the back of my head for later. Because he said, they said the cargo came from Roswell. So he was never at Roswell. He was in Kansas. But he saw the body, and he describes it in the book. He'll tell you how many fingers, what it looked like, and so forth. So um, he said to me in, in, at the museum later, he said, you know, uh, he said, I think what happened was the two craft crashed, he said, uh, in Roswell. And they didn't just pick Roswell. That's where the 509th Bomb Squadron was housed. If you know anything by that, that's the Enola Gate that dropped the bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. They just didn't pick a city. That's where the military uh, threw bomb was in, in uh, I mean, that's where the, the planes were. They were going to go and, you know, uh, cause another disaster. I hope we are not going there again with North Korea. I hope to God we don't go there again. We never learned, and we never learned anything. Uh, so he, he said, um, well, he said, I think they both crashed. And he said, and one showed up 10 years later. I said, what are you talking about? We know they crashed. There was a big thunderstorm that day. And, and the crash in Roswell has three miles of debris on the Roswell Ranch. By the way, I interviewed everybody at Roswell. I interviewed um, Colonel Holt. The mortician who said that he, they asked for children's caskets. I interviewed all those people a long time before. So I know they're telling the truth, Russell, really happened. So he, I said, why, why do you think that happened? And he said, because I saw the craft, he said, in 1957, when I was head of a missile battalion at White Sands. And there it is in New Mexico. There's where the bomb uh, uh, was. Uh, it, it's all in Italian. But, Okay, so let me go to, um, by the way, that's Dawn of the New Age, and we printed it in Italy. America didn't have it until my boss, Moniz, who gave it to Open Minds, 
Open Minds, if you want to download it, it's on Open Minds TV. My boss, Malitu, gave the handwritten notes the Corso had to Open Minds TV. It is not uh, totally the same as the day after Roswell. It's not totally the same. Um, it's the truth. So in order to sell books, sometimes you have to put things that people can go and debunk. So they debunk the whole thing. So Paul Corso went through hell because of four or five mistakes that Bill Burns put in the book. These are his original notes, which he gave us. So when he sat there, he said, well, you know, Paul, and he said, um, I was the head of the missile battalion, and he said, I was flying over this area in White Sands. He was in charge of the nuclear missiles, and he said, I saw a craft down in the ground. So when we landed, he said, I took a jeep, he said, and went out there. And he said, I saw this craft appear and disappear. I didn't know if it was solid or not. I threw some cactus underneath, and it squashed the cactus, so I knew it was solid, but it was also disappearing. And he said, as I was standing there, he said, from the left-hand side came a being, who's not a gray, but he's a being, he's a little man. He looked, we did an interpretation of what he had, because he's, what was interesting about this being is that he had a headband that was silver with a red stone in the middle that Colonel Corso called an interface, because the being and the craft were one. And he said the being walked over to him, Colonel Corso being Italian, a Sicilian, pulled out his beretta, pointed at the, at, the, at, the, at the being and said, friend or foe? And as he's telling me this interview in my room, I don't want to hear it because I don't know how to print it. So he said, Paula, what did the being say? Guess what the being said? I said, he said, neither. And he said, you're right. I'm not your friend and I'm not your enemy. I'm neither. He said, please shut down, he said, the, uh, the radars because I can't leave. Because the radars were interfering with the propulsion system. And Colonel Corso said, oh? And the being said, well, you can come aboard and look at our ship. And Colonel said, well, what do you have to offer me? And the being said, a new world if you can take it. And you're going to hear those words, because my colleagues are using them. <laughs> they come from Colonel Philip Corso. A new world if you can take it. And so Colonel Corso said, he picked up the phone on the Jeep and said, turn off the radars, and he said he let them go. And then he adds yeah, another thing, he's funny, he says, and he gave me a salute, I think he was a military man. I said, I don't, I don't think so, but anyway, he said, and he saluted me. This really happened, but this was not the interview I wanted, because it would make him look crazy. So I said, I don't, I'm not going to print this. He actually wrote A New World, if you could uh, handle it, if you did, A New World, um, what did I say? If you could take it, he wrote it on a napkin, so I have it. I said, no, Colonel, I'm not interested in this. Would you just tell me about your back engineering and, and General Trudeau? And by the way, this all happened for the Colonel in 1960 during the Kennedy administration. administration. So they got Colonel Corso's records. Colonel Corso knew Jack Kennedy. He was very friendly with Bobby Kennedy. He knew that Jack Kennedy was going to be assassinated. He was on the Warren Commission. He was the head of intelligence, and my colleagues are saying he's some, but he was lying and nobody. He was the head of intelligence in Rome. I talk about his time in Rome. He was 28 years old, after World War II, the head of the CIC, which is before the CIA. This man was a genius. And then he said to me, you know, Paul, when, and I've written about this in the book, when I was a little baby boy, I used to walk out in Pennsylvania into the, he said, into the storms, and I used to just look, and I've remembered Close Encounters. Do you remember that little boy that walked out into the storm, and his mother, and he disappeared? Colonel Corso was that. He said, I used to look up in the air, and he said, one time, he said, I was playing marbles on the road, and my doctor in the town car came and hit me, and I disappeared and appeared. I said, is that, he said, these strange things have happened to me all my life, and then he sees the being in Fort Riley, Kansas. Very strange man, very strange man. 
I never printed these things because my job was just to talk about the back engineering. So I wanted another interview, which I ended up getting. This is the doctor. This is the doctor writing to Colonel Corso. Um, and what Corso believed, this is the bean, and he had suction cups on his fingers. Uh, I don't know the, the ventosa, we call them, you know, the suction cups. And, and the bean had a band. And Colonel Corso believed that that was a clone that flew, uh, that, uh, flew the ship. And he said, uh, we have a lot of those bands in the Pentagon. So I said, you mean they've had contact? Like a lot of these silver bands with the, with the, the, the interface in the middle? They all know about them. Remember, I told you Clifford Stone had that manual of 57 different species. Colonel Corso said there were 52. Here is some of his background, and I left all the military records with you, with you, and you, you can give them to anybody that wants to copy them, because this man has a career that's amazing. Um, he did the war in uh, North Korea, in Korea, with, uh, what's his name, uh, MacArthur. He was very upset about the war. He said they made a killer out of me. I blew up villages. He was a war, he was a war hero. He, in his later life, he was so sorry for all the military campaigns he was in because he saw it as useless. And he used to talk to me about that. But this is a man that, that has an integrity, has, has a background. He got the Legion Award number two medal. He's, uh, he, uh, Italy gave him the Italian uh, Italian award. He, he has these are all the things, bronze star, um, and so forth. And my colleagues, and I'm not going to name them, went after him because he was he was a lieutenant colonel and he didn't put the word lieutenant. Instead of looking at this. And uh, or his background. There he is with uh, General Trudeau, and he went to work like a lot of these people from major industries, in this case very rand. Sperry Rand is like Lockheed Martin and all military industrial complex. He went to work for the military. A lot of these guys do that. After they come out, they go to work for the military industrial complex. Uh, and um, anyway, he, he was involved in a lot of things. He, he was Neapolitan. Colonel Corso, I mean, this is in the book, went to the Pope Montini and said, why are you letting the Nazis go to Argentina? You're letting the Nazis escape. Colonel Corso told me about that, 1945. He has a background that's incredible. And he talked to me about how strong he was. He also helped the, um, he also got a ship for the Jews to escape to Israel. He also, he did a lot of heroic things during World War II. These are some of his, uh, he got the, uh, the Italian uh, award there, and there, there's what he looked like when he was young. Uh, and it's all in Italian because a lot of our, here we are, and the television is covering, the Italian television is covering him. And they're very interested in every word. They don't bother to question his credibility. They know who he is because they looked him up. He was at uh, American Intelligence. There he is in Rome, and, and he, uh, you know, he was still general. I mean, a new world will dawn and you will be in the forefront. He said, I hope to God, a new world will dawn. But anyway, he wanted me to go ahead and speak uh, in, uh, after he was gone. And uh, this is where he, he gave me, I, what I have, it's in the book, I didn't bring it, but he gave me the autopsy of the big B, the bodies. He saw the bodies. He went to Wright Patterson. He gave Adriano the propulsion system of the craft, and I left it at the drawing with them. Uh, and he gave me the autopsy of the bodies. The being had one lung. I think it was one lung. It had um, a very small heart. It had. It, 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 it's in the book. There it is. He's got the being. What, it, what a human being has. He, they believed that these clones were created by human-type aliens, human-type extraterrestrials. And these clones were meant to just fly the ship. And it was, remember the history around World War II, 1945-47, and so forth. And this is what he said, spinal column, yes, they all have a spinal column, uh, no nose, uh, and he's got it all. This is in the book. 
Uh, and, um, and, and, and the thing that was interesting, they have a four-lobe brain, because he, he looked at the autopsy, and the brain had a microchip. So it meant that the microchip was probably what was controlling the craft, and they put their hands on a um, kind of a, uh, it's a, a kind of a, you know, like a uh, machine, and the thinking they would be able to use their brain. We're going to do that someday. I'm convinced. Someday they will find a way to fly a ship using the brain. And I think the first ships that, and there's a movie called um, Taken by Steve, Steven Spielberg that's really interesting because Spielberg knows a lot. He knows so much. He uh, has in that movie that they used to get psychics to, and they used to wire them to the UFOs to see the psychics because you used the ESP and the psychic ability to fly the ship. Because I knew that you had to become one of, the ship is alive. The ship is not constructed in any building. It's alive. It feels. It's a biological thing. There we are with, uh, these are the different people that I've worked with. There's Monsignor Balducci. Uh, God bless him for many, many years. He made it okay to talk about UFOs. He was back in Nuncio. Michael Wolf, there's Adriano with me. Someday I'll talk about that case. There's Adriano with Colonel Corso, and, uh, and there's the propulsion system that I left with them about. He, it was uh, a magnetic propulsion system that he, Colonel Corso, um, drew. And, and all of these things, I think, are not something that somebody wanted out. In other words, it was secret. These are secrets that were kept. I took this picture of the Colonel during Easter. Here we all are together. Yeah, I was teaching the, the uh, son of the actor Sersla Andrews. And, uh, and his name was Dimitri. Uh, and he said, my father, Helen, uh, want, he said, you know, uh, took me to Area 51. And Ursula said, I, I want to meet Colonel Corso. So I said, he, so I said, okay, uh, and I brought her over there. Here is the San Marino document. You need, and by the way, there's Desmond Leslie who wrote the book, Flying Saucers Who Landed, by Dansky. So you can imagine the conversation they had. Uh, we, the San Marino document, here we all are together, uh, and Pescara, you can see, let's see, Carlos Diaz, um, Michael Hesseman, Bill Hamilton, famous researcher. Uh, just uh, Wendell Stevens should have been there in this picture. This is us. The press conference is Wendell Stevens. I consider Wendell Stevens the greatest researcher that ever lived. He did all of it, every country in the world. And he's and the he, and, and there's Robert Dean, the assessment. I think I saw that in one of the movies. Uh, the assessment, the one that I showed you. Carlos Diaz, Colonel Corso explained how the ship worked. We're all together at these, this is important. Two times have they tried to go to the United Nations. Sir Eric Gary, I don't know what year that was, um, it's, I think it was uh, in the early 70s, and then we did, and somebody, you know, see, it has to be a country that, that sponsors the resolution. San Marino is a very small independent republic like Monaco. It has nothing to lose, nothing to lose. And it did the resolution to open. There's Pinotti and Lord Sure Enough. And here we are, and, and, and there's a movie about this, talking about the importance of what Colonel Corso had and how the United Nations should take that on. Now, going back here, he signed that paper. I think that was the most dangerous thing he did. He signed a paper for the United Nations to look at the UFOs in the 1990s called the, the, uh, the, the Paper of San Marino. Um, going back here, here we are, he's telling the world. He didn't speak in America like this, only in Europe. And they were all interested. Here we are at Easter time because he had friends. Rapanelli, talk, I'll talk about him. On the right hand side, he was World War II officer in Italy, the Colonel knew. Here's who was at the San Marino signing. Bud Hopkins, David Jacobs, Colin Andrews, 
Big top names. There they are. Yvonne Smith, Javier Sierra. Um, all these people. You got the day. All these people signed a paper with Colonel Corso. Do any of these people talk about Colonel Corso? No. <laughs> they don't talk about having even met him. Hanging out with Colonel Corso and, and uh, Michael Husband is C.J. Jacobs there. And, and we tried. We really tried to do it the right way. Uh, and there's Colin Andrews and Yvonne Smith and um, Michael Husband. Here's the reflections uh, that he had. He said, first of all, he said we were well, well versed in the tactics of our opposition, especially policymakers. He talks about being part of the National Security Council. Uh, so here he is on, on uh, the Tonight Show. We have a show in Italy called La Luz Costanza Show. It's Tonight Show. And, and this was funny, I was in the front row and, and it was total quiet. It's the first time I've heard everybody just quiet. And he goes to Colonel Carso on um, each and he says, were there other crashes other than Roswell? And Colonel Carso said, yes. And he says, don't talk about it. <laughs> this is the, the, the guy that uh, he was the, uh, the moderator, don't talk about it. Okay, so where are we today? Colonel Corso died uh, in 19, I think 1999. He just lived for two years. Uh, and where are we today? Uh, the uh, exploration of space has gone, um, it's gone to the military industrial complex in a way. It's gone to privatization. Bert Rutan, who makes composite airplanes, and Richard Branson, the owner of Virgin Galactic, Galactic Everything, you know, Galactic Train, Virgin Galactic Records, I mean, Virgin Records, they have a spaceport near Roswell where they are selling tickets to go to outer space for $250,000. Ashton Kutcher just bought, bought a ticket. When it's a rotation around the Earth, it doesn't you go very far, you go around the Earth. When these people will start going into outer space, is when, um, is when the people, you can't shut them up. I mean, if, if you have a regular commercial airline that's going around the world and you see UFOs, you can't tell these people to be quiet. You can tell military pilots to be quiet. You can tell uh, astronauts to be quiet, but you can't tell regular people to be quiet. The greatest gift, he said, was the extraterrestrial body, but we did nothing with it. Because we couldn't use it, but we couldn't use it for war was just some anomaly. So uh, we learned that they are one. This is the book that came out in Italy, The Dawn of a New Age. Carol, oh, he died in 1998. At the, that's his, his um, marker. Uh, and I remember going there and putting the rose down there with uh, his daughter-in-law. Uh, and um, there he is, Colonel Philip Corso, uh, buried there. Then they, the family invited me to stay with them in Port St. Lucie. Gave me all his, they gave me a suitcase, they gave me his briefcase, they gave me a lot of things. And I want you to know that I think that the visitation's here. I don't know if you've ever seen this image. This is not a Christian bunch of UFOs. This is just before Katrina. Over, um, over St. Petersburg, Florida. The truth about the UFOs and the release of the hidden technologies to replace fossil fuels and conservation of energy to prevent global warming. The moment that the people speak up, they realize they're all connected. There's not only Al Gore, Stephen Group, but there's also Edgar Mitchell and Paul Howell. These, for me, are the heroes. These guys are the heroes that are willing to speak up. All of them said, release these technologies before we destroy the earth, because we have them. And here's Robert, uh, that you're going to hear later on. Beware of our nuclear capacity to destroy each other. We're in a real tough situation today. United States and North Korea. We don't want, it should not be, it should not be that we ask the ETs to step in. Because that means that we can't do anything for ourselves. 
And all of these people are just, you know, they, they, there's no hope here. They keep going back to the, doing the same things. God bless him. Edgar Mitchell, sixth man to walk on the moon, was born in Roswell, believe it or not. Very good friend of mine. Did all he could while he was alive. He did all I could. There I am with him. And I talked about what, what Edgar Mitchell and I talked about was consciousness. He was interested in ESP, what part of your soul lives on after you die, what you're about. He was interested in those things. Remember Curl's words that the being said to him. He never forgot it. I didn't print that story until after he was dead. I had to wait until he was dead before I printed it because I thought they would, they would, uh, they would criticize. I was worried. I was worried that I couldn't, that, that if I, it did, if I printed that, they'd think he was crazy and they wouldn't look at his uh, intelligence background and the fact that he back-engineered a lot of the, um, the uh, artifacts. They were fiber optics, night screening devices, the transistor, uh, integrated circuits, I'm trying to, and, and high tenacity fibers. The high tenacity fibers went to Monsanto, but they were, the being had on an, a, a covering that was not, he didn't get into it, it was put on him. He, he, it was like they, it was made on him. And the fiber was very strong. And so they knew that if they took that fiber, uh, and he said that they worked with it, they came out Kevlar, like Kevlar. And he said that, that they could use it for different uh, purposes, but that was the being's covering. I don't hate to call it clothing, because it wasn't clothing. If you're more interested in the real story behind Colonel Corso, then you can go on Amazon and get the book. Um, and this is real. And he's a hero, like all those other people that talk. And I really, I really uh, think that I needed to readjust my thinking to why the secret was secret. And as long as these technologies, and as long as all this is kept hidden, it's going to be very, very difficult to, um, to go ahead and talk about the UFO question in general. Because it, these, this is the reality. This man was a hero to talk about it. He was involved in it. Uh, and in his military record shows that he was in research and development. Now, he was given these files, and everybody says, well, we can't find the paper trail. If you read my book, he was given an envelope with cash to pay it so that they could not trace where the money was coming from. And the money, and he talks about bringing German scientists with him. He knew Wilbur Smith. He knew Wilbur Smith in Canada, who was a physicist that Grant Cameron talks about that was involved. In fact, he said, Wilbur Smith said to him, you're so lucky you got to meet an ET. So he, he was interested, he was involved with Sarbucker, uh, another, uh, other German scientists, and he, because he could, he helped bring them over, and he, he knew what the background was. So I keep thinking of these words. I always hope that that will happen. And I think I left enough time. I don't know what time it is if you have any questions. I'm going to look at the watch here. Um, and, and by the way, there are two Paul Hellyer uh, DVDs, the one I was showing yesterday. If people want them, there are no more Colonel Corsos. I did bring his testimony. Um, so we have, what, 15 minutes? Yeah, it's quarter to 12. How much? 20, I think. 20 minutes? Okay, well, um, yeah. Um, I, you're supposed to come up here? Is it that you're supposed to come up here? Yeah.
if they are going to be in a uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, atomic uh, war, uh, it also go on. Um, uh, that I want to say it a bit. Uh, also, they will go out to all that. Uh, a ripple effect. Uh, out in the universe. A ripple effect in the area.
this, I didn't study the hollow earth, and that hasn't been part of my research. So anything I would say would be opinion, and that's my biggest, um, that's my biggest criticism. Opinion is not research. You have to, re I don't do cross circles, because I never went there, and I don't know, but I talked to Colin Andrews, who did do cross circles. I don't do the whole UFO field. I don't have opinions. I can only talk to you about things that I personally was involved in. I don't have all the answers. So the Hollow Earth thing, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I think you should interview him. There's a lot of evidence. Yeah, but I don't think I'm, in, I don't, not I'm interested more in the raising of human consciousness now because with the conference I do in Laughlin, what happens is that everybody wants to do something. We come out and everybody goes, it's not entertainment or it's static and you're watching people talk and everybody comes out and says, what can we do? A new world if we can take it. Let's do something. It's activism. Let's do something. What can we do? Small groups get together, they meditate. Other groups get together and do something. I think we have an awful lot of information. An awful lot. We have enough data move from collects all the sightings. There's enough stuff going out there that if you study this, you know it's real. You know it's real. Now, what do you personally want to do about it? That is what I'm interested in. What do you want to do? Because if we do not do anything, it becomes strictly entertainment. It's in this interesting. Oh yeah, let's watch this. <laughs> oh, let's watch sci-fi. This is real. You have that's what's so hard about my job. I mean, when I talk to somebody like that, I've got this huge responsibility. I waited 20 years to write the book. But when Paul Hellyer crosses over and dies, I know him so well, I know everything about him. I have to do the same thing with him. When Monsignor Molducci died. I have to do the same thing with him. I have to keep talking about these heroes. It's a huge responsibility. It's huge because they're not here anymore. So it's very difficult. It's a very difficult job. I, 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 it's very interesting if I have some free time, I'll read about the Hall of Earth. But right now there's so much out here that we need to deal with. And may I encourage you to become activists in some way. Not just to watch statically here. Do something. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you. Are there any other questions yet? Um, the, the pain that you were describing on there yeah. was very interesting. Oh. The, the pain you was uh, showing on the screen looked very interesting. And I don't know if uh, you've done any research on animal mutilations, uh, but these yeah. animals all over the world are cut mm -hmm. open as if with a, a mm -hmm. laser as precisely as you would do with a laser. They're cauterized and they're, they're, the, the blood is exactly mm -hmm. as well. And do you think that it's possibility. possibly the same thing? That's an opinion. Yeah, it's an opinion. Okay, know the difference between opinion and fact. It's a possibility. Okay. I don't know. Thank you. But it's, I, I thought about that too. I did. Hey, I'm curious. I like to know what kind of energy you use to propel the UFOs. I have the drawing, you have the drawing, maybe you can show it to him. It's it's opposite gravitational. One goes one way and the other one goes the other way. And then he has something in the middle, I don't remember. Because he didn't give me, I didn't study that because he gave it to Adriano. I brought it because it is part of my book. Uh, uh, it, it's like the opposite gravitational that it's causes the craft to to uh, to have an energy and also a plasma field around it. What he gave me, and you remember, he said 180 pages of body, the body of the alien, the being, the the, the clone. He wanted me to study that part. He had gave the other part to my colleague, but you, I gave it. I, let Natalia have a copy of that. If you, if you want to give him a copy of it. Yeah, I like the particular. Yeah. All this is for everybody. So he, I gave him all current Corso's records, 
if you want to do a talk and you see all the things he did, you, I gave him all of that for you to go ahead. Because I can't go all over Norway, I can't go all over Europe and do this. So if you talk to other people, you have the background, you have to read the book.
who was called a defense organization, obviously it's not anymore, since it's running for, uh, wars in many countries, I think about NATO of course. We just had an election, we had a choice, uh, which parties did we vote for? Those who wanted peace and disarmament and to withdraw our NATO membership, or those who wanted to go on and even to uh, to make the question uh, stronger. That's what is happening with our uh, government now. What government? Well, we have a conservative government. No, but what country? Norway. Oh, Norway. Because yeah. not everybody is from Norway. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, uh, politics that's a sensitive yeah. thing, but still, we have, if we are serious, we have many organizations, uh, national organizations in Norway, and worldwide organizations working for peace. And wouldn't that be an immense contribution towards uh, developing uh, the, our planet in a more positive way to reach out for the higher good for all of mankind? And, uh, and, and also to work for, for the environment. And, and these things, they, about politics. We need to be more clear in our understanding about the power processes, what's going on here, and to take a clear uh, standpoint. We can uh, work for the environment, work for peace, uh, work for humanism. Uh, that's uh, at least what, what I'm doing and I want, want to do with our Thank you. Yes, there you go. That's, that's very good. I want to, can I recommend a book for you? Uh, I don't know if anybody reads it. Does anybody read it anymore? <laughs> okay, there is a book that's so interesting, and I read it and changed my life, and then I went to meet all the people involved called. Uh, oh. <laughs> the book is called uh, Reading on the Future Landing on Planet Earth by Stuart Holroyd, and it was an experiment that Phyllis Schlamer, Andrea Bolharich, and Sir John Whitmore did during the, uh, the, the um, and I forgot what year, but when Kissinger went to make peace in Israel. Uh, and these three people, when Kissinger did the accord in Israel, and it was, uh, it must have been during the uh, the 1980s, but it's called the Briefing of the Future Landing, where the ETs <coughs> said, this is fascinating, to Andre Boharich, they said, um, we're going to tell you where to go in, in hot spots in Israel, and you hold hands and meditate in these spots, the three of you, there are one woman and two men, and I always watch the movie, Minority Report, because Philip Dick, that wrote Minority Report and Blade Runner, was involved with the intelligence community. And the, you have to, and, and I always say, and, the, and there was one female psychic and two men in there, so it's the female that's the strongest. He, and, and the ETs had a tape recorder. And Paul Harris, who worked for the CIA, he was the one that brought Uri Geller to SRI, Stanford Research Institute, Uri Geller the psychic. He, the tape would come on, the being would say where to go, and the tape would self-destruct. And then Paul Harris had two watches, and they were in Israel, and when one of the watches stopped, they would hold hands and meditate. There were only three of them. They were there for nine months. <clears throat> And they, he believes that book said they stopped a major war because of the commitment. But the beings would tell them where to go, where to stand, and what time to meditate. The name of the book is The Briefing on the Future Landing on Planet Earth by Stuart Holroyd. I tried to get it because it was a real thing that happened. It didn't take 50 million people. It took one psychic woman, Paul Harich and Sir John Wenmore, and they went where he, where Israel for nine months and went over to the Ukraine. So it was very interesting because I was reading this to see the power of meditation. I was just curious about whether the intention, and meditation is not, is not just a spiritual practice, it's an intention. It's the intention of peace. It's the intention that you have. We really want this to happen, please, we are here, we're doing it, you know, that it's the intention that you do it with. So that's uh, and I've studied that because it was it was connected with Uri Geller, who's a friend of mine, 
Uh, and his connection with UFOs, it's very complicated. I've studied this so much to see if we can change courses of events in a timeline. Ricardo Gonzalez, with whom I'm involved right now, his whole work is on world peace to change a timeline. Because the future is already known. If you can change that timeline, you won't have that future. So that's why I'm interested in, that's why I'm interested in right this now. Thank you very much for your attention.